Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina, your host and the president of the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. Today's program is going to focus on the Jones Act, but with a little bit of a twist. Uh, many people who support economic freedom oppose the law, which is a 1920 maritime law that restricts shipping competition between United States ports. Today, I'm going to be speaking with Luis Ponce. He's the co-founder of Puerto Ricans United in the Diaspora, or BUDPR. It's an advocacy network that promotes progressive policy options intended to improve life for the people of Puerto Rico. He's also a director of BUDPR Action, which is a 501c4 nonprofit organization. In this program, Ponce is going to discuss with me the progressive case against the Jones Act and how it harms the people of Puerto Rico and perhaps what we can do about that. Please welcome to the program my guest today, Luis Ponce. Luis, welcome. Aloha. Aloha. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Aquina. I'm very happy to be in this program. And, uh, you know, uh, hello to all uh, your audience. Happy to be here. Well, we have a special tie being from islands uh, across the world from each other, but we have a great deal in common because of our geography. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. We're very, we're very happy to be here and with our Hawaiian brothers to talk about this important issue. And we've done that quite a bit. Uh, we've been in contact with people from Puerto Rico who care about the economy, most definitely, and the impact of the Jones Act. So I'm glad today that we're going to get your perspectives on that. Yeah, thank you. Um, again, you know, uh, it's my pleasure to be here and inform your audience. But first, tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, I'd, I'd be really interested to know how you got into the work you're doing now. And also tell us a little bit about the organization. In fact, I'm going to take the liberty of reading from your Facebook page. It mm -hmm. says, we are a network of Puerto Rican professionals ready to activate other Boricas, which means Puerto Ricans, uh, Puerto Ricans uh, mm -hmm. in the diaspora to fund progressive community-led organizations in Puerto Rico. And with that, tell us a little bit about yourself and your organization. Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, happy to do that. Yeah, well, uh, I got started very early, you know, when I was young in uh, activism and advocacy in Puerto Rico because uh, of the colonial re uh, reality of our island, right? We are a U.S. territory with no voting Congress and really, uh, you know, don't we don't elect the president. So since, you know, since I knew that, I knew things needed to change. Uh, fast forward a few years later, after uh, going to uh, Georgetown University for undergrad and then to law school back in my uh, home country of Puerto Rico, uh, I just continue to become active in uh, uh, civic issues, uh, in community development uh, uh, work. And that eventually uh, led us uh, to form uh, with other, with other uh, uh, law school graduates from Puerto Rico, uh, our, our orga organization back in 2017, in August of 2017, just one month prior to Hurricane Maria, we knew it was going to be a, a BC hurricane season. So it was kind of like a preemptive move from our from our part to help uh, not only fund and engage Puerto Ricans on the island and their organizations that don't have uh, a voice or or leverage in Congress, but also to inform Americans and, law, and lawmakers about the fights, the issues, the, the problems of our island. Uh, so that's how we uh, became became to be. And uh, and besides, you know, working with organizations in Puerto Rico, we actually have uh, uh, a big uh, advocacy effort uh, permanently in Washington D.C. through one of our co co founders, uh, and we are constantly engaging. Uh, lawmakers about Puerto Rican issues. We're constantly connecting Puerto Rican organizations, grassroots uh, organizations in Puerto Rico to lawmakers and really just um, educating them through social media or events. And, uh, and particularly uh, in the times of COVID has been a lot through virtual events. And we led in 2020, actually, we led uh, a very interesting uh, panel with uh, uh, Colin Grabo from the Cato Institute, with uh, yes. other economists from Puerto Rico to discuss precisely the Jones Act and the cabotage laws. That's right. And and we have been aware of your engagement with the Jones Act issue. And Colin Grabo is also one of our scholars at the Grassroot Institute. Now, you've been through so much in Puerto Rico, yeah. not only the history and political status and their impact upon your current economy, but natural disasters 
And in all of that, of course, the Jones Act has figured a role. Um, how did you get involved as an organization in dealing with the Jones Act? And, and what kind of advocacy are you pursuing with regard to it? Well, uh, first off, we're trying to create more awareness uh, about this issue and also moving, moving the needle a little bit more from the conception that there's in Puerto Rico that uh, mostly independent supporters or anti-American groups are uh, you know, in favor of repealing or exempting Puerto Rico to actually bring uh, like, like the Grassroots Institute, like Cato Institute, right? More into the fall so Puerto Ricans can understand that this is not, all, this is not like a, a, a purely ideological thing. This has to do with a larger conversation about the, not only the economic freedom of Puerto Rico, but the economic development and actually also making things more livable and uh, accessible to the large majority of Puerto Ricans, we are unfortunately under the poverty federal line, right? So we're trying to mix all those things by creating these alliances and groups and just showcasing that our thought or, or that the thought that people thought in Puerto Rico was only of a small sector is actually a larger campaign, a bigger sector and a larger uh, preoccupation to with the uh, economic farewell uh, of, uh, of well, sorry, welfare of uh, of our people. Well, Luis, I couldn't agree with you more that collaboration, crossing the aisle, working together, and finding common ground are absolutely important in going forward. And when it comes to issues that affect our people across the board, uh, th there's no place really for partisanship. We really have to work together. But but as you know, the Jones Act often receives support from politicians and others who consider themselves uh, quote unquote liberal or progressive. Can you explain why progressives in your thinking may want to reconsider their position with regard to the Jones Act? Well, first of all, and especially after the Black Lives Movement, uh, the Black Lives Matters, uh, which we wholeheartedly support, you know, people have been paying attention, you know, to historical grievances, uh, 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 racism, colonialism, and I think, especially for Puerto Rico and Hawaii, probably more than other uh, 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 territories because of the magnitude of, of, the pop, of the population, you know, we are people that sometimes are overlooked by the American discourse, right? So that's why probably Americans don't engage uh, around the Jones Act. So that's the first thing I, I will tell, you know, uh, I, we, we tell uh, progressive, right? This is like a, a, a decolonial issue. Uh, in the particular case of Puerto Rico, these laws were imposed on us. We didn't have any making or, or or way of you know of negotiating this, and it just affects our everyday life. And then the second one is like it's actually affecting the uh, home economy of thousands of thousands of uh, uh, Latino families in Puerto Rico, right? We're like people of color, and we are being like economically disenfranchised thanks to the Jones Act, which actually you know in a in studies that have been made in Puerto Rico, you know, like the negative effect to the Puerto Rican economy is $1.5 billion. That basically means $1,050 more expensive for each family in, in Puerto Rico. So when you also compare that with the poverty rate in Puerto Rico, then, you know, it's it's a no-brainer that this needs to change. Uh, and I finally, you know, I think I think it also, it also has to do with another hot topic of the progressives, you know, which is a, a climate resiliency, you know, in the face of climate change. Puerto Rico imports almost 90% of our foodstuff. And all of that mainly, and you actually only comes from the Jacksonville uh, 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 port uh, uh, in Florida. I mean, many people think on the Jones Act and the hurricanes, oh, okay, so Puerto Rico will get hit with the hurricane. But what happens if the hurricane devastates Florida as it had happened in the past? Then, you know, Puerto Rico will never ever get, you know, in a timely manner, uh, the necessary uh, um, emergency relief uh, material food to actually recover. So I think those are like the three main things that I tell progressives uh, on the Jones Act issue. It's obvious that Puerto Rico is at a tremendous disadvantage due to the Jones Act economically, but I'm glad to hear you explain that some of the issues that are dear to progressives that are engaged in that as well. There are some uncanny parallels between Puerto Rico and Hawaii. Mm -hmm. As you were talking, I was just listening. And one of them, of course, is the high level of economic impact of the law upon ordinary families. Another one comes from the name of your organization, Puerto Ricans United in the Diaspora. So what caught my eye at first was diaspora. 
uh, because that's often used to talk about people from Hawaii. Uh, we have a, a dwindling population in our state because economic uh, conditions are driving people to leave the state. In fact, when it comes to native Hawaiians, the indigenous people, the majority of them live outside of Hawaii, uh, which is a surprise to everyone. Uh, but tell me a little bit about diaspora as part of your name, and not only your name, actually, what I'm really asking is as part of the experience of the Puerto Ricans who have left their homeland, uh, what are the causes of this? Yeah, no, uh, uh, thank you for that question. I'm very glad you asked that. And, uh, and you know, it, it actually, uh, what you just mentioned, right, the fact that even Hawaii as a state has dwindling population, people are leaving, uh, 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 their their home islands. It's 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 something that we see that could potentially happen to Puerto Rico uh, uh, if if it ever become a state. And it is actually already happening. And uh, it is happening under you know the U.S. sovereignty and under you know all the programs, mostly all of the programs that we will also have under under statehood, which is what you know statehooders in Puerto Rico say, right? So I think that's a that's a uh, worth that that's great that you mentioned that you know uh, I I was I was actually fully aware of that um, the term diaspora yeah we we also use it and, and there's been like a there's been a historical diaspora from Puerto Rico uh, in the uh, early uh, 20th century up to the mid uh, 20th century right a lot of workers exiting Puerto Rico to help especially the fruit and vegetable industry in the East Coast and then like the canning and the industrialization of of the East Coast. Uh, and then I will say there's a more recent diaspora, which our group is part of, like the three of our co-founders and most of the people we work with, with are Puerto Ricans that have left their, uh, uh, you know, our, our island just to make ends meet, um, has happened because of the, uh, I always say, you know, of, of, of the triple uh, terror of uh, the uh, debt ridden economy of Puerto Rico like after uh, Section 936 of the Federal Revenue Code expired in the early 2000s, that just uh, started depressing the, the the economy, and there wasn't a, a proper plan to address that. Uh, and you know, administration in Puerto Rico knew that I was coming, and they never did anything. That skyrocketed the debt, and in turn, that provoked the U.S. Congress to impose a federally sanctioned and unelected body called. Uh, the Puerto Rico Oversight and Management, and Management Board, which has actually impacted, uh, uh, inflicting a lot of economic pain through large austerity measures. And then finally, I will say the uh, all the uh, natural disasters, which you know some can also be character characterized as man-made disasters, like hurricanes, ma mainly right due to climate change. But then also we also had uh, earthquakes, and then the pandemic, right? So all that has just exacerbated. Uh, I have put so much pressure on, on, on Puerto Ricans that there's no other option, unfortunately, especially for, for professionals uh, uh, to leave their family behind, their friends behind, and try to look for, for a better future. Most of us go to the U.S., right, because of the U.S. citizenship, right? And, uh, you know, it's, it's essential. It's the country that invaded Puerto Rico, right, and, and that controls Puerto Rico. But there are other many thousands of Puerto Ricans that are, like, all across the world, right? So that's what we call diaspora, right? Like it's, it's it's the it's the Puerto Rican nation abroad, right? Away from Puerto Rico, and uh, as me, as any other diaspora. And with this, I want to end. Uh, and contrary to uh, some of the opposition we have received, diasporas are fully engaged on on what is happening back in their countries, you know. And there are multiple examples across different nationalities and countries. And uh, probably I would like to know more how Hawaiians in the diaspora keep engaged with Hawaii. But, you know, we have the Irish diaspora historical, you know, we have uh, uh, in cases, you know, uh, the, Bang the Bangladeshi diaspora, uh, uh, just to cite a more, you know, a third world uh, uh, country example, right? That they're constantly active and sending money back to, uh, to, their, uh, to, to their families. And the Puerto Ricans are no exception. We want to, we, we want the best for Ireland. We have still family we have friends we actually go back often to puerto rico and what we're seeing is something that we don't like so that was like the main drive to actually form uh but pr we wanted to change that and if we have power here uh in the united states we we can vote 
we can uh, move uh, lawmakers, we can move other people on behalf of Puerto Rico, we will do it. There's no question that we will do it. And that actually has been the hallmark of our work. We have gone to move people on issues and talk about issues that are usually uncomfortable, but need, need to be addressed in order to change what we are unfortunately are seeing in Puerto Rico, which is a mass exodus, ma massive brain drain, and the economy, honestly, is not recuperating. Luis, I'm glad that you pointed out the actual toll upon Puerto Rico of this exodus of its people. It, certainly, it's political in terms of losing population base and even the opportunity should it arise to ever increase the number of representatives in Congress. Um, it's definitely, as you put it, the brain drain, the loss of economic capacity, and culturally, people are leaving their home. And so um, I, I personally feel with you, being from an island home, and seeing our population leave. Uh, we want to work hard to be able to create economic conditions that make it possible for our children and grandchildren. Yes, yes, precisely. And if I may ask, you know, that, that also comes to the cost of, of course, like a population displacement and population replacement, right? So, so now in Puerto Rico, and I did see some of the studies that you have done, right, that probably necessarily people from the outside are not impacting the prices. But in Puerto Rico, uh, it is actually in Puerto Rico, uh, 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 mainland Americans can now afford the houses in Puerto Rico that Puerto Ricans cannot afford, right? And there's like a whole movement now in Puerto Rico calling against that uh, displacement, which I know is a very uh, a controversial issue. But, you know, what's going to be the future, right, of Puerto Rico when right. Puerto Ricos leave? Puerto Ricos cannot afford uh, uh, to actually buy a house uh, 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 on the island, right? I think it's, 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 it's getting to a very, very complicated situation down there. And uh, to follow up just on that point alone, uh, you've touched on another dovetailing similarity between Hawaii and Puerto Rico, and that is the cost of our housing. Right. So exorbitant. The, the average person simply can't afford to buy or even rent. Now, mm -hmm. going back to what you mentioned in terms of natural disasters impacting Puerto Rico, in 2017, Hurricane Maria struck, struck very hard and did billions of dollars of damage from which you haven't fully recovered at all. Yeah, um, yeah. How in particular has the Jones Act made recovery from Hurricane Maria difficult? Well, I mean, the, the first thing is that when immediate help was needed, uh, neighboring countries, which of course, you know, are independent sovereign countries, couldn't easily, you know, uh, come to our assistance. You know, like we have, uh, and you know, and, and not to get into any political uh, or ideological debate, but you know, like Venezuela is almost our next door neighbor and they have oil, right? So we could have probably have you know easy access to oil right uh, uh, in the aftermath. The same with foodstuff from the Dominican Republic uh, uh, and from other like uh, South South American La La Latin American nations. And and the fact of the matter is that that wasn't even uh, you know that wasn't even po possible. Like Puerto Ricans had to wait. Uh, there was like an emergency like army uh, 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 and, 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 and you know U.S. Navy move that they actually were the ones that bringing and just like dropping foods out from the helicopters. Uh, and uh, and I know it was also part of uh, during President Trump administration, he actually uh, lifted, they, he waived it for like 10 days, which wasn't sufficient, right? It was like trying to cure a cancer patient just by putting like a bandage. Uh, and that I think also uh, uplifted the debate about whether, uh, you know, uh, the Jones Act uh, needed to be, uh, uh, you know, repealed for Puerto Rico. Uh, uh, so there was great suffering because the emergency response couldn't be fast enough because we had to wait for Jacksonville vessels to actually come and deliver the, the needed goods. And, you know, uh, uh, thankfully, uh, it didn't, a major humanitarian tragedy was avoided, but that doesn't, you know, uh, uh, say that it couldn't happen again with a more powerful hurricane or a hurricane that, for example, hits Puerto Rico and then on the way north also hits Florida. And then what are we going to do? So I think that's 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 the fear that Puerto Ricans have started to realize. Uh, and the other compounding factor, right, because I know and, and I know we're going to get into the uh, aspect of re, um, uh, refuting some of the uh, uh, proponents of the Jones Act or, or, or the defenders of the Jones Act. But the, the thing is that even though, yes, the Jones Act will allow foreign ships 
to dock and you know to deliver goods then after that they cannot go to the to to the u.s port right so that actually like defeats the purpose of these other vessels to actually you know participate in from the uh, economy of of the biggest economic partner in the hemisphere right so that actually dwindles the uh, uh, possibility of Puerto Ricans having a more diversified economy uh, on shipping and uh, and of uh, actually being part of the logistics of international maritime trade. And that again has negative effects on Puerto Rico, as I just mentioned. But during a crisis, we will just be, you know, in basically uh, in a deserted island in the middle of, of nowhere because we don't have the proper tools, the proper uh, uh, vessels are, or the proper you know uh, legislation to actually keep puerto rico uh stop keep puerto rico safe during uh an emergency like like with maria or an even greater natural disaster which everybody's expecting that it's going to happen again right it's important that the lessons be learned and we follow up on them now uh, there is so much more that you and i can talk about but i, know. I want to jump ahead to a, a subject that you had agreed to discuss as we close off our time together um, a recent study by the Transportation Institute, which is a pro-Jones Act group, purported to show that the Jones Act actually provides economic benefits to Puerto Rico, <laughs> and it ensures reliable shipping. You've taken a look at this study. What, what, what is your position on this? Yeah, well, uh, the the first thing that comes to mind is that, you know, um, we always ask this, right, when, when we are trying to understand Puerto Rico, uh were there any you know puerto rican scholars involved in this study you know like what and what was the method the methodology of this study right so yeah then you know it can be open to to, to scrutiny and this is something that we actually raise a lot because a lot of people can talk about puerto rico you know and you know and, and we're not here to to question the validity of science and all that but you know if you don't bring the people the experts from from where things are happening then you know i think uh, the results of these studies are not, you know, uh, are not truly to what is happening in the real in, in in reality. The second thing I will say is that, uh, you know, the reli reliability factor. I mean, was just you know uh, highlighted during the an emergency, right? And the fact that all shipments come all shipments come from Jacksonville, right? I mean, that's that's you know that equals to me to a monopoly, right? So you know, if that monopoly breaks down then Puerto Ricans are stuck, right? Puerto Ricans are then like left behind, right? So I, I will also like, you know, like uh, counter argue that. Um, and and the numbers done by Puerto Rican economists, and actually there's like a coalition between the, you know, the Puerto Rican Ch Ch Chamber of Commerce, the uh, the minorities and other like groups in, in Puerto Rico that are also banding together. And we have actually had them in some of our events, you know, they have, uh, you know, shown how expensive it actually is for Puerto Ricans, right? It's uh, almost like, 2.5 times more expensive, right? And all that costs are passed, you know, to Puerto Rican families, right? So I, I mean, I, I, I think that study. It seems that it was made, you know, as a, as a political, you know, uh, uh, gift to to the supporters. And I know, right? I know there are other aspects of the Jones Act that that are beneficial or could be, you know, refrained to be beneficial, you know, like uh, labor, you know, military, national security. But at the end of the day. Uh, 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 you know, uh, and we have discussed it here already, is just making a big drain in Puerto Rico's economy, it hindering Puerto Rico's, Puerto Rico's uh, ability to develop itself, to be part of the international uh, uh, maritime uh, uh, logistics. I mean, again, it's, co it's costing $375. Uh, uh, this is a story made in 2016 per individual in Puerto Rico for the Jones Act, right? So that just reflects uh, on cost, and now with the inflation, worldwide inflation, you know, the, the cost in Puerto Rico is just skyrocketing. So I, I, I have my doubts around that, that study. I will definitely like to, uh, I will be ideal, right? Like we can get, uh, uh, you know, the methodology around that, get the whole data so we could uh, analyze it. Uh, but essentially this is something, and with this I'll finish this, this question, that in the past, you know, economists in Puerto Rico have definitely refuted, right? Uh, uh, there's a, a great uh, uh, economist, uh, Jose Caraballo Cueto, he's a professor at the right. University of Puerto Rico, Calle. We also had him with Colin Grabo in our program uh, back in uh, 2020. And uh, yeah, he has been great in refuting one by one all these myths, and, and I will say even like fables, 
that uh, the supporters of the Jones Act have put together. Well, Luis, you've been wonderful in the presentation today. I appreciate the work you and your organization are doing. Thank you. Let's, let's move ahead to help the people of Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and the entire world. Now, as we close, tell our audience how they can get in touch with you if they'd so like to do that. Yes, for sure. Well, uh, you, you mentioned earlier, right? Like we have a Facebook page. Uh, uh, so you can just like put a bot PR on Facebook and you can find us. We also have a website, uh, botpr.org. Uh, that's our main uh, website where you can also, you know, sign up, be engaged, uh, and see all our past events. We're also active in Instagram uh, and uh, uh, on Twitter. Uh, so, uh, but uh, you know, actually, we, we have almost like a five 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 thousand follow-ups on Instagram, and we have like more than uh, thirteen. Uh, um, like 13,000 uh, uh, followers uh, on Facebook. So, and lastly, our email is patria, like, like motherland in Spanish, patria, P-A-T-R-I-A at botpr.org. Terrific. Luis, thank you so very much. We're going to continue to work together toward our common end. My guest today has been Luis Ponce. He's the co-founder of the people, the Puerto Ricans United in the Diaspora and uh, you can get a hold of him directly. Much aloha to you. See you next week. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.